Hey there, fourth trimester listeners. Our program today is proudly sponsored by Family Album, your secure haven for sharing baby photos and videos. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love, one photo at a time. Hi, I'm Sarah Trott, and welcome to the Fourth Trimester Podcast. I'm a new mama, and this podcast is all about postpartum care for the first few months following birth, the time period also known as the Fourth Trimester. My postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, is my co-host. She's a mother, grandmother, perinatal educator, birth and postpartum care provider. Fourth Trimester Care, our topic, is about the practical, emotional, and social support parents and baby require. And importantly, it helps set the tone for the continuing journey of parenting. Welcome back to the fourth trimester podcast. I'm here with my co-host and postpartum doula, Esther Gallagher, and we are joined today by two special guests, Alexis Monier and Katie Lonergan, and they're going to go ahead and introduce themselves a little bit more in a moment, but just to give you a quick reminder, everyone can go to our website, which is fourthtrimesterpodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter and also click on sponsorship where even just a dollar an episode would be so helpful for us for continuing the production of this wonderful program. Um, And to give you a little background on our guests today, we're so excited to have them. So Katie uh, has her PhD. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice in San Francisco, where she enjoys working with individuals and kids. She has experience in infant mental health and Gottman baby home and emotion coaching. She is passionate about helping individuals and families regain joy in their lives. And Alexis Monier, she is a licensed marriage and family therapist in San Francisco, specializing in couples and new parenthood. And the two of them have been working together for the past year, having gone through some training together um, and putting a new program together. But just quickly, I'd love to turn the mic over to the two of you to give a a quick explanation of, of your background and what you're doing and how you came to work together and and bring this group to life. So I originally started working with couples and, and I've worked with couples through a variety of life phases and through issues that include parenthood. And I started to notice that something different was happening with, with the mom, with some of the moms. And, and this kind of perked my interest a little bit. So I started to get some more education, but, but something in my own experience of motherhood is what really, really, um, helped me to gain momentum in working with postpartum mood disorders. Um, I had postpartum depression and, and as a therapist, I was confused about what was going on and, and, so coming out of that experience, um, having done some research for myself because I didn't get caught in the OB office, um, I wasn't diagnosed with that until I essentially diagnosed myself through some research. And the more I researched, the more I realized that this was a legitimate, um, this was a legitimate problem for the community. Lots of women were not actually being diagnosed and not receiving help. Um, And lots of people really didn't need to suffer. So I started to make it my mission to help couples in um, solidifying their relationship so that they have the resources and knowledge when the baby comes to like be fortified and and gain support if they do in fact experience postpartum depression or anxiety Um, and also to support moms through that experience um, to normalize that experience or at least build a community around them so that they don't feel um, so different and shameful in contrast to all the mamas out there who have the normal mommy bliss. Um, yeah, I mean, think through my experience and the experience of sitting with people who have this 
this um, diagnosis, I really became passionate about helping people. And Katie and I started working together through this training and we just, we came together with this common passion and we've built a group together that is starting in September, September 21st. Um, and we're so excited to be adding a resource to the community because there are far too few resources for this group. That's such a great story. What can you tell us about the mission of the group? Um, first, thank you so much for having us on. Um, the, so for the mission of the group is primarily just to have a safe space for women to share their authentic experiences postpartum. And like Alexis was talking about, you know, I think there's so much shame that can come up. You know, motherhood's supposed to be this amazing time, you know, women who've been looking forward to it most of their lives. And, and then it turns out not quite how they expected and I think that there's something wrong with them. And when there's not, I mean, a lot of times it's just needing additional support. So for the mission of the group is really having a safe space to share with other women and with us um, and building some tools for them to help go through this very difficult time. Um, but like I said, the main thing is having that, that de-shaming aspect um, that often comes up for these women. That's very interesting. What are the sorts of things you hear women saying? If you, you know, I mean, I realize you can't give away. <laughs> there's, there's always the, um, you want to protect their privacy. But I'm curious about the sorts of things women express in terms of feeling shame around this period. Because I do, I do think it's the major thing that keeps us from getting the support we need. And so mm -hmm. I can imagine that women are having those thoughts before they walk in to see you. Mm -hmm. And it might be very interesting to our listeners to hear those, those thoughts <laughs> and how, how they are associated with depression and anxiety as a way of sort of cluing themselves into, Oh, if I'm thinking this or if a girlfriend of mine is saying this about her experience, this might be a good reason to seek more resource. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think some of some of the things that come up um, are, you know, gosh, this is so much harder than I ever expected. Or sometimes if people are, you know, maybe underreporting, if they're saying, like, oh, it's great, and they leave it at that without, you know, additional details. Um, you know, one of the things that the research has found that among other, um, other, uh, among other risk factors for postpartum depression and anxiety was having some perfectionistic tendencies. And so, you know, this, you think about it, the sense of being able to have everything just so, um, can create a lot of calm for some women having that sense of control, you know, enter in baby, um, world gets turned upside down. Um, and so kind of this ideal version of what it was going to be like versus the reality can be a huge, um, huge difference for these women. And so some of the things, you know, maybe like, gosh, I can't ever get the baby to stop crying or if, you know, I'm not sleeping when the baby's sleeping. Um, and some, I mean, Alexis, I'm sure you have some additional great ones to add. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I hear women saying that they feel really overwhelmed. And this, you know, of course, like new parents are overwhelmed, but it seems out of proportion to the experience, which I think it can be difficult to know. Um, but also feeling guilty, feeling like they should handle parenthood better. Mm -hmm. um, often, but not always, women feeling like they're not bonding with their baby. Um and, and, you know, feeling a deep sadness or worry. Um, a lot of times I hear women talk about feeling very irritated, irritated um, and struggling in their personal relationships, often with their partner, often with parents or in-laws. Um, and sometimes women report this being really, really worried and it affects their sleep. Um, it affects their eating patterns. And, you know, so if, if a new mom is 
is gaining a lot of weight during that initial period, or if they're losing a lot of weight really fast, that can be a cue. Um, but a lot of women are good at masking what's happening by presenting themselves in the world in a way that's pretty put together, um, especially, especially if there are perfectionistic tendencies. And so some of these things can be pretty hard to see because that shame really um, causes us to to hide all of these other factors like guilt and overwhelm and worry. Ah, oh, that's so true. I, th- I wonder how much uh, the expectation part goes into that. You know, when you say perfectionism, it's mm-hmm. just, uh, you know, when people have that kind of shame, it sort of just highlights perhaps this expectation that things should be a certain way. Um, has that been something that's come up in your conversations with new parents? Of course. Um, you know, and it comes up in, I think, usually as I'm not a good enough parent. I can't help my baby to go to sleep. I My baby wasn't latching. Um, you know, just feeling like they should be doing more. Um, Definitely the shoulds. I hear a lot of a shoulds. Lot of shoulds. Like, I, I should be able to do this all myself. I should be able to, you know, do, do my job and, you know, be with baby or, you know, I chose, I chose to be a stay at home mom. So this is my doing. I should be able to do it all then. And, you know, it's so hard because we, we live in these more isolated times where, you know, like here in San Francisco, there are a lot of people who are transplants and don't necessarily have extended family here. And it's just, I mean, one of the major factors in helping these women is having some sort of social support, which kind of goes back to our, our reason for doing this group. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hear, like Alexis was saying, like a lot of the, the shoulds, um, which can be, which can be a little problematic, um, when, you know, being a new mom is super duper hard and we, you know, we just want to have them do the best that they can. It doesn't mean they have to do everything. And I think, this day and age, too, with, with the advent of um, Facebook and Pinterest and whatnot, you know, these new moms are posting the good days and, um, you know, making those comparisons just is, is not serving these women who are struggling. Wow, oh, yeah. I'm pregnant or a baby or not. Sometimes looking at social media can be extremely depressing because it's yeah. a, a <laughs> lots and lots of photos of happy people at their best. And um, it's tough to compare in general. What would you have to tell our new parents or people who are about to be new parents or people who are supporting new parents around realistic expectations or um, anything that you think would be useful? I would, I would remind them that, you know, well, we used to live in tribes, you know, not, not us as individuals, but people did in general and it was that's how we're wired um so seeking help is one of the most important aspects of this no one person can take care of a a child by themselves and i mean even if you can complete those actions you know you can still benefit from having um, from your baby having another perspective or for having time to be able to shower. Um, you know, there's no shame in asking for help. I think that's one of the biggest barriers is asking for help because we feel like we shouldn't need help. And that's why I mentioned this, this tribal ancestor that we all have because we all existed in a community of help. We've gotten so far away from that, um, but we're still wired in that way. So get help, whether that is um, doing a laundry service, um, ordering takeout sometimes, um, asking your neighbor to cook you some food. Um, you know, know the people in your friend group and community. Really think about who is going to come over and take care of your child for a few minutes. Um, and ask them to do that. Um, know who's like likely to drop off 
a casserole that you can freeze and, and eat later. Know who's in your community and ask specifically for some of the things that you need during that time period. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes, no oh, sorry, Go didn't ahead. mean to speak of you, but um, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about how um, often parents will not know anybody in their community unless and until they actually look out into the community to find out what kind of groups are around them. Mm -hmm. And if they can find a group that sounds like it's a category (laughs) that they fit into, then they can move out from there into, well, who are, who are the people I feel companionable with? Who are the people I enjoy their sense of humor? You know, like you develop a sense of connectedness from there. Um, and of course, I think that we've constructed a culture that has, especially in the Silicon Valley era, that has potential parents working such insane hours day and night whether they're home or not i mean people bring their work home and stay up till one in the morning um so just eking out the time kind of time to join a play group (laughs) an adult Mm -hmm. play group where they might meet people who they can play with and form friendships and companionship let alone such a group for parents to be because you're you know in the first three months after you have a baby it's going to be a lot more challenging to form those however the good news is that there's lots of parenting groups if if it takes you till then to get into some sort of group where people share your needs and values around having kids at least then there are you know breastfeeding mothers groups and your group (laughs) and, um, you know, infant massage classes and things of that nature where people can find each other. Yeah, those groups are great and, and they're great opportunities to, um, to meet other moms. Sometimes with postpartum depression, moms aren't, or anxiety, they're not necessarily reaching out to other moms in groups um, because there is a sense of being other. So I would encourage, I definitely encourage moms to be participating in the groups and reaching out in groups and really kind of putting the feelers out to see if there are any moms who have like experiences. And if they have trouble making it to those groups, um, hopefully hearing this podcast and relating to some of the things we're saying would um, inspire someone to seek out therapy or seek out a support group, um, to seek out an environment in which they feel comfortable sharing their authentic experience, right? Because in a play group, sometimes, you know, you may or may not meet someone who who has that similar experience or may or may not meet someone who is vulnerable enough to show that in public. Right. Um, you know, so hopefully people are meeting and, and finding those connections and, and then being able to share their experiences that way. And if not, to also um, know that what you're going through is is okay and to seek therapy really can be helpful and help your baby. Um, I guess that's one thing I wanted moms to also know is that this impacts you as a mother and as a person, and it also impacts your family. Um, so one of the reasons that we encourage people to get help with this and to shift beyond the shame is one, because it's not your fault. You didn't choose this. And also because, you know, partners struggle to know how to support their, their, um, their wives. And 
there are resources that can help them to be a better support. And it also affects attachment style for babies and developmental delays. And, and again, I want to say that, you know, this isn't something that women are choosing when you have PPMD. It's something that you experience and that you cope with. And I want to encourage moms to be getting help <clears throat> because it does have long-term impacts on families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of adding to what Alexis is saying, you know, I think a lot of times moms have a hard time maybe doing something for themselves, but would do anything for their child. And so kind of framing it as, you know, when we talk about attachment, we're referring to um, like Bowlby's attachment theory, which is very different from attachment parenting. Um, but in the sense that, you know, these early relationships with a primary caregiver, which oftentimes is the mom, um, that they set up uh, the individual's uh, working model for what the world is like, whether it's, you know, the world is a safe place, a supportive place, or, you know, an untrustworthy place, or, you know, even worse, a frightening place. And so in in forming these secure attachments, what we mean is that the moms and the babies are in this continual communication of these, you know, as Dan Siegel talks about it, you know, this repeated and expectable pattern. So, you know, this infant gets to learn, like, if I have these needs, I have these cues that I'm giving my mom, that she she's able to respond and in an effective way. And so these parent, you know, the mom has this sensitivity and response responsivity to the child that then the child learns like okay all is well in the world and I know some people think like oh well I don't you know gosh if I have to be attuned to every little cue of my child I'm going to drive myself crazy and the thing is you don't have to be attuned to every single last cue it's about doing it uh you know 70 percent of the time or so I think the research said like between 30 or 40 percent of the time you can get it wrong it's about it's about the repair which means kind of that reconnection of, okay, maybe you missed a cue that the baby needed the diaper change. Okay, it happens. And, you know, you you have the, the moment of repair where you're like, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. Oh, you were trying to tell me, you know, your diaper was full. Now, mommy's got it. And so they have that regained sense of all being well with the world. And that's that's what we mean about the attachment theory. I love your example of actually saying that to your baby, even though they don't understand all the words yet. Mm-hmm. It seems like they really understand what you're saying. Oh, they do. They do. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's so helpful with the language development. And, you know, thinking about a postpartum woman who is struggling with depression, who maybe doesn't have the energy to interact with the baby as much. You know, this is why we view this work as preventative. You know, we want that mom to get that support that so she can be attuned to the cues of the baby, can be having those lovely conversational interactions of like, oh, look at baby, you know, having, having that, those moments of joy, but which is so hard when you're feeling depressed and overwhelmed and like, you just can't get anything right. Um, So so yeah, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. If we could um, back up into the mom again, because I also like that example very much. Um, The question that I've been harboring uh, since we started this interview is that we often talk about anxiety and depression or or anxiety or depression. And I am somebody who experiences something that was once described to me as anxiety-driven depression. And mm. so I'm wondering if the two of you, for our listeners, can maybe tease apart uh, or or meld together, whichever is you think appropriate, the kinds of experiences moms would be having if they're experiencing anxiety, depression, or that fabulous combination package of sort of that, that paralyzing kind of anxiety, the kind of anxiety that keeps you from leaving the house, keeps you from moving out of what you think is your comfort zone, et cetera. So can, can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Esther. Um, you know, I think, yes, a lot of times they do kind of go hand in hand, so that, that lovely twofer. Um, and so sometimes it can be that the anxiety comes up first and, you know, hallmark of, of anxiety is kind of ruminative, ruminative thoughts, meaning like you just can't stop the, the worry thoughts. You're trying to go to sleep. That's all you can think about. You know, you might have some psychosomatic symptoms, meaning like, you know, clammy hands, racing heart, stomach, GI issues. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, that sense of overwhelm from those racing thoughts, you may not be engaging in things as much. So then there's some um, understandable avoidance behavior that can happen, which then can kind of turn into like, oh, gosh, I really should be doing this, but it's really hard. And then kind of that shame piece comes up and that's where it can switch over into the lovely depression as well. Um, whereas on the depression side and, you know, the postpartum depression affects between, you know, 10 to 20% of new mothers. Um, whereas the anxiety, which, you know, can show up, you know, at its extreme, you know, is panic disorder where they have these unexpected out of nowhere, just completely physiologically overwhelming senses of like panic and dread. That happens, you know, in about 11% of, of new moms. But on the depression side, Alexis was kind of um, going through some of this stuff that, you know, there's there could be um, increased sleep or decreased sleep, but, you know, a big change from what it was like before, which is hard because with new motherhood, like sleep is totally thrown off. Um, you know, there could be some agitation, some mood ability, meaning like big shifts in mood. Again, that's hard to parse out sometimes because of the major hormonal changes, um, which speaking, which also wanting to separate out the difference between postpartum depression and um, baby blues, which, you know, about 85% of new moms do experience baby blues. And that is very much tied to the massive change in hormones that happens after birth. And it tends to be more transient and usually peaks maybe in third or fourth day and then would last maybe hours to a few days, but certainly kind of wrapped up after about two to three weeks post, um, post birth. And so if it's going longer than that, that's when it's um, important to kind of maybe seek some additional support um, and get that postpartum depression um, treated because it is very treatable. Mm -hmm. And I think some, some examples of anxiety and depression or that combination, um, you know, needing to make all of your own baby food and feeling totally inadequate if you cannot accomplish that, even possibly skipping feeding yourself because you are um, very adamant about providing everything for your baby. Um, moms, when they're feeling anxious, tend towards like overstimulating the baby because they don't need a lot. They need, um, you know, physical closeness. They need food. They need to be changed. And, and they don't need a lot of stimulation in the beginning. Um, and an anxious mom is more likely to be missing cues because they're trying to provide a lot of experience for their baby. Um, or trying to accomplish a lot and, and then their own health, um, and their own sleep is, is suffering at that point. And sometimes, um, you know, then relationships begin to suffer because other people don't understand what's, what's happening or understand how, what's necessary to, to be a good mom. Um, and then the judgment that comes when you can't accomplish all of those things because it's so exhausting, um, that can kind of flip into to depression because it's just not possible to be everything in every moment for your baby. And that can feel like failure. Um, so it definitely can get locked up in all of the expectations not only that, but there are tons of parenting blogs and lots of parenting advice out there, and nobody agrees on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're trying to figure out what to do, you might find seven different um, seven different blog posts and all of them saying something different, and it's very confusing. 
So you cannot be everything. Um, and a depressed mom, you know, might be laying on the floor and falling asleep while their baby is playing or, um, you know, so they might sleep more and miss some cues because they're so tired or their baby might be laughing and cooing and they're crying, which, you know, is still somewhat normal, um, but not being able to pull out of sadness uh, and connect with the baby. Um, that's a quite common experience in depression or wanting to like be away from the baby even is a very common experience feeling like you might um you might infect your baby with your feelings or your emotions you might cause something bad to happen to them if you are not feeling okay so wanting to be away from your baby and even run away from your house some women have thoughts of hurting their babies even though most people don't act on that um, and there's a lot of shame involved in that, so people don't really talk about it, but it happens quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's something that happens that you can cope with, and that's a reason to, that's kind of, that's like a signal. These are all signals to know that you should, like, seek out a group or find some professional help. Hey, fellow parents, can we take a moment to reflect on the joyous chaos that is parenthood? You know those days when our hearts swell with love at the sight of our little ones and we're bursting at the seams to share every adorable moment with the world. But let's be real. Some things are better kept in the family, and your loved ones who matter the most aren't always close by, and they might not be that tech savvy either. So how can you easily share your baby's beautiful growth with loved ones while keeping your precious memories secure? I remember the frustration of trying to use some of the big tech photo solutions, only to find they fell short of what I needed. That's when I stumbled upon something truly remarkable, the family album map. The Family Album Map was created to give parents a secure and easy way to share photos and videos with loved ones. It's an orderly and totally secure haven for your family's personal memories. I love that there's no third-party ads, no unwanted eyes, unlimited storage, and that it's totally free. So to all the parents who are out there still trying to use other messaging apps for your kids' photos, it's time to level up your family photo game with a free photo sharing app. Head over to the App Store today, search Family Album, one word, download the app, and start creating a legacy of love one photo at a time. This has come up before on some of with some of our other guests. Um, this notion that it's really tough to reach out to other people when you're in that moment of of anxiety or of depression. I mean, the last thing you want to do is like, you know, get shower, get dressed, grab a coffee, go get a sitter or whatever you need to do, and then get yourself some help. It's like really hard to get that motivation. Mm-hmm. So uh, some people in the past have mentioned, hey, you know what? Before you're at your worst, <laughs> when you're in a moment, a good moment, it might make sense to go ahead and think about what those resources look like. Write down the names and numbers of uh, of all the groups, of all the people who may be willing to care for you or who you would want to go care for you, um, you know, before you have the baby, while you have the energy. Um, what do you think about that as a strategy or do you have any other strategies that you think just sort of from a practical purpose of preparing for parenthood um, would be helpful? Those are great. That's, that's a great strategy. Um, I have a baby proofing your relationship workshop that I give in, in that workshop there are it's pregnant moms or, or um, a pregnant couple. And that's one of the pieces of advice that we give. Go to websites and look up some of the symptoms for postpartum depression so that you know ahead of time. Um, you know, hopefully you'll never have to use that information, but it's always good to have that understanding so that you can catch it and get help. Um, I agree. Writing down all of your resources, assessing your friendships, um, looking at all the groups that are in your area and preparing ahead of time for that, Um, just in case it's better to have the information and not need it than to not have it when you need it and, and, you know, you don't have the capacity to be able to find it. Um, I think those are really great tools. I think preparing your relationship is really important. You know, when you have that attunement and that solid foundation as a couple, then you're set for your family to have a solid foundation. 
So managing, um, managing conflict style, um, getting on the same page about what parenting style you each plan to use. Um, you know, I've had couples who argue about how much to hold the baby. Um, and so there's a, a difference in parenting style that creates a rupture within the relationship and with with a postpartum mood disorder on board that's really difficult to navigate um and and that woman also is kind of missing a piece of her primary support um so preparing your relationship to continue intimacy and to manage conflict after the baby comes is, is a little piece of advice i have mm-hmm. Along those lines, I would, I would just reiterate for the 50th time. Um, <laughs> there's a great book for parents to read in their first trimester called Becoming the Parent You Want to Be. Mm-hmm. And um, it talks about the fact that you're going to have different styles and different values. And those are conversation topics. And um, it occurs to me as well that, you know, most partners have nothing to prepare themselves for their own potential mood disorder, let alone that of their postpartum spouse's mood disorder when it comes. Like there's just very little in the culture that says if your partner is is behaving in these ways, then a discussion about anxiety and depression is waiting to be had and here are the ways Mm -hmm. in which you can start that conversation without judgment and support your partner like they're just Mm -hmm. that just isn't the conversation we know how to have in our culture um so i think it's great when there's any way for people to start looking at that previous to having a baby um, Mm -hmm. and potentially having a game plan (laughs) Uh, because it's not just moms, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. One in 10 dads also have a postpartum disorder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, I think it's not even something that has to be gendered. Um, you know, however you are now a parent, whatever your sexual assignment, um, you are prone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, and I think this converse, this, this piece of the conversation is one of the reasons that I had developed a program for parents to prepare their relationship. I call it baby prep. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm helping them prepare themselves and their relationship for this really huge life transition so that they're both clear in having that conversation about how they cope with, um, difficult experiences, what, um, from their family history they want to maintain or, or change, um, and providing them with a structure so that they're, moving into this transition with as much information as they can possibly have. Um, I agree. It's really important for both partners to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I mean, it'll either come out consciously or unconsciously. (laughs) Kind of, (laughs) a lot of times parents know how they don't want to parent. You know, maybe they were not particularly thrilled with how they were parented, and they, but they don't necessarily know exactly how they do want to parent. And so these programs can be so helpful in really figuring out the values as these new parents and setting up new traditions. Um, there's one thing that I was thinking back to the question about um, maybe family members or other people um, in the new mom's life. You know, another th- way that anxiety can show up is if, if the mom is not letting anybody else hold the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know Alexis was also talking about on the depression side, maybe like very quick to hand baby over to someone else, like feeling like, oh gosh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best one to take care of this baby. Somebody else is better. 
On the flip side, it can show up that only I can take care of this baby. Only I know what's right and nobody else can hold it. And that, I mean, that can make such a strain on the mom. Mm -hmm. Because gosh, if you are having to hold that baby, be with that baby, attune to that baby 24 seven, oh my goodness, that is so exhausting. And you know, I, I talk to these new moms who are stay at home moms. They think, oh, well, it should be so easy. Like my work, it was so hard, but this is supposed to be easy. I'm like, no, this is one of the hardest jobs in the world. To be attuned to this baby, to meet their needs is, is exhausting. And like Alexa said, it takes a village. It takes a tribe. And I was reading recently that there are some, some third world countries where there, it is still kind of tribal living and whatnot. And there is next to no postpartum depression in those communities. And I think that speaks volumes to the importance of the support while also acknowledging how hard it is for these women to reach out. You know, because like we were talking about, there may be some of those perfectionistic tendencies. It's like, I should be able to do this all myself. And that, gosh, if I ask for help, then that means like something's wrong with me or I'm weak. Um, we get that a lot, you know, thinking like, oh, it's it's a weakness to reach out. And it's like, actually, that is a sign of tremendous strength to reach out well, for support. I will add to that, that, you know, this this very idea of the neo-local family is extremely, not, not only is it toxic from my point of view, but it's extremely recent in human uh, uh, behavior, you know, group behavior. Um, nobody would have been raised this way prior to the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and that wasn't that long ago, you know, so... <laughs> So we here we're walking around thinking that this is how our mothers did it and our grandmothers. And that might be true, but probably our great grandmothers didn't. Right. And that's not that long ago. Yeah. So um, the fact that we look around and we see this happening does not make it healthy or normative in any way, you know, mm -hmm. Um, and those moms that we're looking out, seeing as looking so happy and together, they're probably rich and can afford a lot of support, <laughs> you know, or, or, or extremely fortunate to be, it. sorry. Oh, sorry. Or they may just be really, really good at masking what's really sure. going on. Exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I often say to my clients who say, well, you know, what about so-and-so, <laughs> you know, what about those ladies I see out there? I say, first of all, you probably don't realize when you see those moms that they're three months postpartum, not newly postpartum, for one thing. <laughs> and you don't know what kind of help and support they have. Mm -hmm. So comparing yourself to them and comparing your experience to them isn't helping you. <laughs> no, it's crazy yeah. making. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. It sometimes seems like a bit of a double standard to say, okay, go out and get lots of help, like outsource as much as you can, get people to help you with watching your kid or making you food or cleaning your house. And yet also saying, oh, well, only rich people can afford that. That's <laughs> really hard. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it, but um, there's an article in the New York Times that just got published. And the title is Want to be Happy? Buy more takeout and hire a maid, study suggests. I, I saw that. Yeah. So, I mean, this is true outside of postpartum too. Like people yeah. who, um, people who spent money, I'm going to quote it. People who spent money to buy themselves time, such as by outsourcing dislike tasks, reported greater overall life satisfaction. So this is, um, you know, people from Harvard who did research based on surveys from around the world. This is global found that people who, uh, are able to have more time for themselves, um, just in general, are happier. So, of course, you know, that's going to translate across people of all situations, postpartum included. And I'm just curious, um, you know, how do we how do we say, well, you know, you've got to spend all this money on your baby. You have to, like, buy a crib or you, whatever it is that you think is necessary for baby, for the nursery or for, you know. There are some things, there's, you know, there's real expense that goes along with having a kid. And <laughs> shift your budget priorities is what I would say to that. <laughs> right. Cribs, cribs are not necessary. <laughs> well, okay. So there you go. There's the perspective. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, I, I think it's an interesting conversation to have, especially like going back, like tying this to the conversations with your partner beforehand and preparing is like, how do we want to use our resources to create the experience that we want? And although it may seem like a luxury to have someone clean your house once a week or once every couple of weeks or something, or I don't know, have a, have a food service, you know, there are all kinds of food services now. Um, you know, so you don't have a friend or neighbor or something like maybe that's really well justified because the result is a a happier experience for the entire family. Right. Yeah. And we've talked about on this show before, you know, the amount of money people will spend on their wedding, their new car, uh, their fancy furniture, and then turn around. And when it comes to having, uh, forms of support like birth doulas, postpartum doulas, therapy, baby care, uh, and housekeeping, suddenly the budget has dried up. (laughs) So yeah, I I think it's, we, we will be happier as a culture when we do shift those budget priorities. I think it'll be interesting to watch. (laughs) Right. And that probably comes up for things like therapy too, whether it's individual therapy. I mean, Alexis, you've probably heard this from people, you know, they say like, oh, well, I just can't afford it. But, but that investment is, um, for some reason, it's not seen with the same level of value as material goods. Mm-hmm. And I think in, in regarding the, the fourth trimester, it's of utmost importance because the emotional quality of your household impacts your child in ways that they will probably never really fully understand, right? It's, it's a pre-verbal period. And, and so, you know, ruptures during that period, if someone um, isn't accomplishing being there for their baby uh, at least 40% of the time, if, if it's unreliable or if there's um, not goodness of fit between mom and baby that isn't addressed, you know, that really has an impact that could be long-term, right? So taking care of yourself during this time period, I would say is paramount, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you're building a foundation for how your child sees the world. And if that means that, you know, you don't have a new car, but you are able to feel more free to smile at your baby, um, really take that into deep consideration. Yeah. I mean, how much is the cost of having, um, your knowing that your baby's having a better experience and maybe that's something to really sort of clue into or, or dive deeper and focus on it. So this aspect of, well, it's not really a luxury for me to have someone clean my bathtub or my house or whatever it is, bring mm-hmm. me food, but it's, this is for my baby. And that's, that's a little bit easier. I think as a new mom to digest, um, cause that feeling of selflessness is pretty potent when it hits, you know, you're like, Oh, wow, I will, I will do anything for my baby. And to the point where I'm not even washing my own hair, or brushing my own teeth, which is, you know, obviously, there's a balance that needs to happen. Um, but but if the justification for these things is that, hey, it's temporary, and this is going to create a better, perhaps lifelong experience for my baby, then it absolutely does seem worth it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I was thinking too, back to the question about like how, how can others support these new moms? And, you know, I think for so many people, like we've talked about, it's so hard to ask for help. And so a lot of times I talk with them about, you know, or people in their lives that it's important for when you're offering help, like, Hey, you know, Oh, I know you just had a baby. Let me know what I can do. It's like that. You know, that's a tough one. I mean, it's wonderful that they're offering. And I say, you know, why, why don't we take it one step further? What specifically can you offer? Are you good at cooking? Great. Make a meal for them. You know, do you like cleaning? Awesome. Go over and help and clean. Do you enjoy spending time with a baby? And does the mom trust you with the baby? Maybe take the baby for, you know, half hour or something so mom can actually get some sleep. And so making it really specific and think on the flip side too, 
you know, kind of going back to that conversation about um, having the having the parents to be, you know, really think through what would be helpful for them once baby comes is having specific like the things that would be helpful for them. So it goes both ways about offering and asking for specific help. I love that. Me too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's another great reason to be educated about, about, you know, the possibilities. And if you have a friend that you witness and suspect may be experiencing a postpartum mood disorder, then you can become a part of their community, right? And we're all working to help each other. Katie and Alexis, thank you for coming uh, to our show. <laughs> being being on our show, I think uh, uh, it's been really lovely. Uh, I imagine on behalf of our listeners that there are groups similar to this in most major cities and probably some smaller communities as well. Yeah, and actually the postpartum.net website is a yes. phenomenal resource and they have they list they have a warm line that you that you can call at any time and then leave a message they'll call back. Um then as well they have um groups listed, support groups throughout the country listed and I believe Canada as well. But yeah postpartum dot so, yeah. Well they're mm-hmm. international now. There's oh, yeah. postpartum international or something like that as well. And um so yeah they're uh We've had Jane Honickman on the show twice. <laughs> oh yeah. And she she was one of the founders of that. Amazing. Well, Sarah and Esther, thank you so much for having us. Um <clears throat> this is a topic that I think Kitty and I can't talk enough about. So <laughs> thank you so much for helping us to share our our story and our message with people and and we really hope this helps someone to to identify and um, within themselves or their partner or a community member and really, you know, seek out support because this postpartum mood disorders um, respond really well to to community support and um, in connection with other people. So, so hopefully people will be reaching out and and having better experiences. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for being on the show. You've been wonderful guests, and we're, we're very pleased to share all of this information. And we just want to give you a moment to share a little bit about the group that you're doing for anyone local in San Francisco, if you want to share that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so the for those who are local here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we will be starting an eight-week closed group um, on September 21st, 2017, Um, and it will be a a smaller group of about seven women, and it will be a safe space to share authentic experiences of what new motherhood is like, um, as well um, providing some psychoeducation around self-care, around, you know, navigating, you know, navigating communications with in-laws, um, partnering at, or parenting with your partner, as Alexis has talked about. Um, and anything else you want to add? And, you know, part of the education is, is, um, talking about these different aspects of new motherhood and having people share their own experiences. And part of what we're doing is also providing tools like, starting each session with a short um, mindfulness exercise that they can take into their lives and really providing um, like that emotional connection in addition to some concrete tools and and ways of coping um, that will that they can use or not use but you know hopefully will benefit them and and help them to shift the experience that's fantastic i I'm sure our listeners are aware that I am a huge fan of the mindfulness-based stress reduction approach. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. What website can people go to to learn more about your group or you as individuals? Oh, yes. Um, for the group, um, the website is postpartumsf, as in San Francisco, dot com. 
Um, and then on there, there are links to our individual websites as well. Um, I think spelling them out may be a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> but yeah, postpartumsf.com um, about the group. And then you can find us on there too. Perfect. Thank Great. you so much. Oh, and of course, there's always the fourth trimester podcast.com where you can sponsor us, please do, and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. You can find out more about Esther Gallagher on estergallagher.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast in order to hear more from us. Thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope you'll join us next time on the fourth trimester. The theme music on this podcast was created by Sean Trott. Hear more at soundcloud.com slash Sean Trott. Special thanks to my true loves, my husband Ben, daughter Penelope, and baby girl Evelyn. Don't forget to share the fourth trimester podcast with any new and expecting parents. I'm Sarah Trott. Goodbye for now. Hello again. Bicycle man, I know you're doing all that you can. I wrote the song, simple and true. I wrote the song, I'll sing a song for you. You got your wheels, you got your gears. You ride around town without any fear You got your pedals, you got your brakes You always wear your helmet for safety's sake